Goodison Park, the stately, high-profile headquarters of the affluent Everton Football Club. Stanley Park, where it all began. The boys from St. Domingo's Church played football here, adopting the name Everton in 1879. A public field had its limitations, and soon the club were looking for a private ground. They briefly used Priory Road, but in 1884, this first Everton team moved to Anfield and turned professional. They were founder members of the Football League in 1888, but four years later fell out with John Holding, their landlord, over the terms of their rent. Rebellious Evertonians left for a new site, a field on the other side of Stanley Park, in Goodison Road, leaving Holding to form a club called Liverpool. Everton had already won the championship. Johnny Holt, Alf Millward, Edgar Chadwick and Fred Geary were part of their 1891 team, the first to take the title from Preston. Two years later, Everton reached their first FA Cup final, losing 1-0 to Wolves at Fallowfield, Manchester. In 1897, they were beaten finalists again, losing 3-2 to Aston Villa at Crystal Palace. But in 1906, Everton's fans returned to London with something to celebrate. Sandy Young's goal gave them victory over Newcastle. Already renowned for their stylish football, Everton had now won both major honours. Right half Harry Makepeace and outside right Jack Sharp played for England at both football and cricket. But Sharp's goal in the 1907 final couldn't prevent defeat by Sheffield Wednesday. Everton were among the first to adopt a nickname. They were affectionately called the Toffees after a sweet shop near Goodison Park. And already, early in the century, Everton's ground was among the finest in the country. Bobby Parker's 35 goals steered Everton to their second championship in 1915. But now the queues were not to watch football, but to join the war effort. And many recruits never came home to Merseyside. Everton kept going thanks largely to Secretary Will Cuff. He was later chairman and also the president of the Football League. A player whose career stretched either side of the war was Sam Chedzoy, the winger who in 1924 dribbled the ball straight into the goal from a corner and forced a change in the laws. After league football resumed, Chedzoy was part of an Everton squad being strengthened to meet a golden period in the club's history. Although in the early 20s, it was Liverpool who were twice champions. Everton were winning lots of friends, but not enough matches. Perhaps they weren't taking themselves seriously enough. But that changed when an 18-year-old centre-forward was signed for £3,000 from Tranmere Rovers in 1925. William Ralph Dean was known as Dixie because of his tan skin, but hated the nickname and preferred being called Billy. A born leader of both team and forward line, Dean had all the attributes of the complete centre-forward. Strong and brave, always a handful for one or more markers, he was uncannily accurate with his head and possessed a fulminating shot in either foot. As a young boy, Dean had been captivated by his only visit to Goodison. And now, in the late twenties, huge crowds came to see him, especially when Liverpool provided the opposition in derby matches. Dix's natural athleticism and dedication to physical fitness enabled him to survive a motorcycle accident in which he fractured his skull. But soon he was back, his heading unimpaired. In 1927-28, as Everton approached their third championship, Dean's goal tally mounted at a frightening rate. Goodison fans wonder whether he could top the 59 that George Camsell scored for Middlesbrough in the second division the season before. Dean, now an England international, was terrorising first division defences. With three games to go, he'd amassed 51 league goals, nine needed for the record. Then came two against Aston Villa at Goodison, so he wanted seven from the last two matches. He got four in a 5-3 win at Turf Moor, so when Arsenal came to Goodison on the last day of the season, with Everton already champions, Dean required a hat-trick. Early on, and there was about four minutes to go, and I managed to get this goal from a corner kick. And of course, the crowd simply swarmed onto the ground, and one in particular had a load of whiskers on him, rubbing all over my face, and I was in a nice state. Giving you a real continental kiss, eh? Giving me a real do. Dean's 1928 champions drew a compliment from the celebrated Steve Bloomer, 
who said Everton always served up football of the highest scientific order. That would apply to future Everton sides, but this one had a setback. Two seasons later, Everton were relegated for the first time. They won the second division championship at the first attempt and then took the first division by storm. Dean scored five in this match against Chelsea, five more in a 9-3 win over Sheffield Wednesday, four against Leicester, hat-tricks against Liverpool, Sheffield United, Blackburn, Huddersfield and West Ham. He totaled 45 league goals as Everton became champions for the fourth time. Their team now included goalkeeper Ted Sagar at the start of an Everton career that would span 24 years. His total of 463 league appearances is still a club record. Warney Cresswell, signed from Sunderland, was an accomplished left back whose style was ahead of its time. Ted Critchley, Chedzoy's successor on the right wing, provided a stream of crosses for Dean. There was Jimmy Dunn, one of Scotland's Wembley Wizards, a delightful inside forward. Tommy Tosh Johnson from Manchester City made up a sparkling trio with Dunn and Dean. Jimmy Steen came from Dunfermline to succeed Alec Troop on the left wing. Jock Thompson, another Scot, was a forceful halfback throughout the 30s, winning two championship medals. Ben Williams, a product of the Welsh Valleys, was Cresswell's partner at right back. And Charlie G from Stockport played centre half for England within a year of his Everton debut. The following season, 1932-33, these players turned their attention to the FA Cup. Everton beat Leicester and Berry, and the fans packed Goodison for the fifth round tie against Leeds. The Yorkshire side in striped shirts faced an intimidating atmosphere. Everton had now developed their stadium with towering stands. Leeds, who would be great rivals in a later era, did much of the attacking, but Everton scored the goals that mattered through Dean and Steen. There was no prospect of Everton retaining their championship, but the Goodison faithful was savouring the possibility of an unusual hat-trick. Second Division Championship, First Division title and FA Cup in three successive seasons. This victory brought that dream nearer, and it came closer still when Everton thrashed Luton 6-0 in the sixth round. In the semi-final at Molyneux, Everton's opponents were West Ham United, struggling near the foot of the second division. Hot favourites Everton opened the scoring through Jimmy Dunn. This occasion, like many down the years, emphasised the size and loyalty of Everton's travelling support. They expected the champions to capitalise on that lead, as Everton dominated much of the game. But before half-time, West Ham equalised through their revered centre-forward, Vic Watson. And now the fans from East London were cheering. With Watson's opposite number, Dean, not making his normal impact, West Ham survived until the interval. Indeed, this was the only round in which Dixie failed to score. And as the light started to fail, it was left to Ted Critchley, recalled because young Albert Geldard was injured, to scramble Everton's winner in the second half. That goal earned Everton their first ever visit to Wembley. Their opponents would be Manchester City, but Critchley was not picked for the final. 18-year-old Geldard was fit again to play on the right wing and help service his captain and centre forward. It was to be a memorable occasion for all Evertonians. 92,000 people at Wembley and many left outside for the All Lancashire Cup final between Everton and Manchester City. To a great burst of cheering, the two teams file out with their shirts numbered for the first time in a cup final. Everton White, 1 to 11. Manchester Dark, 12 to 22. Now the Royal Standard signalises the arrival of the Duke of York, who is representing His Majesty. The Everton players are the first to be introduced to His Royal Highness, by Dixie Dean, their captain and famous goal-scoring centre forward. The Duke of York, who is accompanied by Sir Charles Clegg, President of the Football Association, then meets the Manchester City team, presented by Sam Cowan, their skipper. 
Clarendon Dean toss up under the eye of the referee, Mr. E. Wood of Sheffield. And is it an omen that the Everton captain wins with the coin? And so matches the kick off against the Sun and into a slight wind. Toslan, the city's right winger, is soon in the picture, but is robbed by Cresswell, Everton's left back, probably the best man on the field today. Then Stein, Everton's number 11, and outside left, has his first shot at goal, which Langford, the city's keeper, gathers and clears. The two captains fall out. Cowan, number 18, is acting as policeman to the dangerous Dixie, number 9. And the Everton centre forward doesn't get a chance in these early stages. When he does, he misses it. Oh, Mr. Dean, what an open goal to dream about for the rest of your life. But within two minutes, the mistake is repaired. Stein has an easy shot when Langford, the city goalkeeper, pushes the ball out to his feet. And the congratulations come fast and furious. The Duchess of York is taking a keen interest in the game. Beyond her is seated Lord Derby, their great Lancashire sportsman. After half-time, Everton, with their goal lead, continue to press despite all the wiles of James McMullen. Number 13, the city's brilliant inside left. Watch this throw in by Britain, the Everton right half. His wonderful kick presents Dixie Dean with a chance in the goal mouth that she doesn't miss this time. Congratulations to Dixie. That was a great goal, and it's worth seeing it over again. Britain to Dean. Dean, ball, goalkeeper, all into net in slow motion. One of the gamest fighters on the city side is the outside left, Brook. But no goals came to him this cup time. Geldart, Everton's speedy right winger, is another hero of the conflict, giving Langford a lot of trouble with his accurate shots, centres and corner kicks. From one of the latter, Jimmy Dunn gets Everton's third goal. And a little right inside from Glasgow puts the issue finally beyond doubt. Head of the second division, 1931. First league champions, 1932. Cup winners 1933. What a record. Well played, Everton. Well done, Dixie Love. Manchester saying out tonight. <laughs> They've got out to say. But Evertonians had plenty to talk about. When the team returned to Liverpool the following Monday afternoon, the reception was tumultuous. The cup was carried from Lime Street Station through the city centre in the same coach used by Everton's previous cup winners in 1906. Dean was suitably impressed by the welcome. It's very, very much a mouthful of players. It's wonderful. I never expected it, but thank you very, very much. This was a champagne period for Everton Football Club. Outside left Jimmy Steen's medals, on display at Goodison Park nowadays, reflect the golden harvest the club reaped in the 30s. Everton were fashionable and widely admired. And one young man waiting to break into the first team was Joe Mercer. And they were a great side. You know, the Sega, Cook and Creswell, Britton, White and Thompson, Geldad, Dundee, Johnson, Steen. It was magic, you know, to be there with them was something. What kind of a man was Dixie Dean, oh, off, off the pitch? Wonderful. Marvellous. All the fun in the world. Great. Great. Marvellous fellow. Like kids, you know, he encouraged the kids. He was quick. And the scored goals knocked him in from all ways. Dean left behind his own legacy, a scoring record unparalleled in the club's illustrious history. It earned Dixie pride of place in the Everton Hall of Fame. And in his later years, Dean's views were sought on modern strikers. No, I don't think they're good enough. As a matter of fact, uh, the marking, I've had as many as two and three every time I've gone for the ball. In 1964, a testimonial match was held for Dean at Goodison between Everton and Liverpool. And poignantly, it was at a Merseyside derby on the ground he graced that Dixie passed away in 1980. Back in the 30s, Tommy Lawton was his successor signed as a 17-year-old for six and a half thousand pounds. I got off the train on the Saturday morning 
And uh, I walked down and got the tram to spell the lane. Then uh, the uh, tram conductor says, uh, you're young Lorne, aren't you? So uh, I said, yes. I think, oh, well, that's, you know, a big head. And uh, he said, well, he says, good luck, lad. He said, but you'll never be as good as Dixie. I thought, well, that's charming. Lawton needn't have worried. He too was outstanding, especially in the air, having perfected his technique with his first club, Burnley. The old ball used to have lace, a leather ball, and we used to hang it uh, from the rafters. And Ray Bennion used to have a stick, uh, and he'd make me jump. He'd swing the ball from the rafters uh, on a rope, and uh, he'd have a stick and he'd make a mark and say, right, take off from there. And if I didn't take off right, he used to whack me on the backside. So I didn't, uh, I didn't miss very many. Lawton scored 34 goals as Everton won their fifth championship in 1939. Joe Mercer was now established at wing half, where he also served England. The war interrupted Joe's career 29 of his internationals were played in that period, while he was rising to the rank of Sergeant Major. Tommy Lawton also joined the forces, and like Mercer, captained England in the 40s. And Cliff Britton was another international from Everton, forming a splendid England halfback line with Stan Cullis and Mercer. A certain Harry Catrick was at the forefront as Everton's players inspected the Goodison Park pitch in wartime. Football continued on a regional basis, but the stadium didn't escape bomb damage. When football officially resumed, demob happy fans packed the grounds. Everton had appointed their first manager just before the war. Theo Kelly stepped up from secretary. He had a flair for public relations, which he needed when the club sold Lawton and Mercer. But in 1948, Kelly went back to his old job and Cliff Britton returned as manager. That was the year of Goodison's record attendance, 78,299 for the Merseyside derby. Two years later, the great rivals met in the FA Cup semi-final at Main Road. It wasn't a happy day for Evertonians. Liverpool won 2-0, their first goal after half an hour lobbed in from distance by Bob Paisley. A year later, in 1951, Everton were relegated for only the second time. But the directors stuck by Britain and the fans stood by their team especially throughout another thrilling cup run in 1953. Victory over Manchester United was followed by another First Division scalp at Villa Park. With Liverpool-born Tommy E. Jones having taken over at centre-half from his namesake, the Welshman Tommy G, Everton held their own until half-time. In the second period, however, a decision was reached. The hero was Everton centre-forward Hickson. Evertonians had a new idol. Dave Hickson from Ellesmere Port was robust and fearless, and that goal meant another semi-final. At Main Road, Manchester, Everton kicked off against Bolton, wearing white shirts, and the first half was just a case of goal scoring by Bolton. Holden got the first in nine minutes. Next, inside right, Moyer. There followed two in quick succession by Lofthouse. Really, with this rate of scoring, it's almost like being in Twickenham for the Calcutta Cup match. Now Everton had a chance. Clinton took a penalty, but missed. The toppies went down hard-head, however, and they scored through Parker in the first minute of the second half. And from a free kick, Farrell got their second. Everton scored again through Parker to make it 3-4, but Bolton go to Wembley. So for Everton, a second semi-final defeat in four seasons. 1953 also saw the retirement of the evergreen Ted Sagar, who'd kept goal in the cup final 20 years earlier. After three seasons in the second division, Everton won promotion in 1954. Britain's team included two Irishmen who gave the club great service, captain and wing half Peter Farrell and outside left Tommy Eglinton. But again, Everton's number nine had become a cult figure. Dave Hickson was as determined on the pitch as he was retiring off it. Manager Britton knew that dashing Dave would supply guts as well as goals. Flanked by inside forwards Wally Fielding and John Willie Parker, 
Hickson displayed a tenacity which sustained Everton during the fitful 50s. I always put it this way, <laughs> I would have died for Everton, I would have broke every other bone in my body for any other club. That's how I look at it, you know, it, uh, it was that much I would have died for this club, yeah. Ian Buchan was made first team coach when Britain left in 1956, but Everton made little impression in what was an undistinguished period for the club. Even when Johnny Carey arrived from Blackburn in 1958, Everton remained in the lower half of the table for two years. But the club were at the forefront of new developments. Floodlights went up and under soil heating by an electrical wiring system was installed under the pitch. Goodison Park maintained its position as one of Britain's most advanced stadiums. A new team was emerging. Goalkeeper Albert Dunlop was joined by right back Alex Parker from Falkirk. Local grammar school boy Brian LeBone established himself at centre half. Little Bobby Collins from Celtic was an impudent, inspirational inside forward. And now Carey raided the transfer market to add exceptional and expensive talent. He signed Roy Vernon, the Welsh international, from his old club Blackburn. Jimmy Gabriel, a 19-year-old wing half, cost £30,000 from Dundee. Billy Bingham from Luton brought trickery to the right wing. And then there was Alex Young from Hearts worshipped and adored at Goodison in the 60s. But at the start of the decade, it was little Bobby Collins at just five feet four inches who was the heartbeat of the side before he moved on to Leeds. He tipped the scales at little more than 10 stone, but in Carey's team, Collins was worth his weight in gold. And Collins making a lot of ground, only five foot four, but what a wee blue devil, a lovely pass to Mickey Lill. Mickey Lill's there, he drives it, and it's a goal, a beautiful goal. Kelly's his way through, and he's going in the goal! Oh! Oh, my ring to Collins, to Vernon, Vernon's there with a great chance, Vernon's there, it must be a goal! Ring around the outside of Bond, Ring's going in with a chance, Ring turns it back, comes back to Vernon, Vernon drives it! Goal! The money behind the new Everton came from John Moores, who took over as chairman in 1960. A co-founder of the Littlewoods organisation, he'd supported the club from boyhood. But when Everton finished fifth in his first season, Moores wasn't satisfied. He sacked Carey, breaking the news in a taxi. And down the years, Moores often repeated his Everton philosophy. Everton expects success. We have a very good crowd and a very good crowd, a very uh, crowd who are very loyal. But of course, they pay money and they expect to see us do well. If we don't do well, then something should be done to guard it, and something will be done about it. Modern Chief Executive Jim Greenwood puts John Moore's contribution into perspective. Well, probably the main influence is the stability he's brought to the club over all those years. The fact that uh, he's been a stable influence in the background, whether he's been on the board or off the board, and uh, we've always known that Sir John was there, and um, I, I think, yes, it's stability. Moores brought Harry Catterick back as manager in 1961. His first signings were 19-year-old Gordon West, then the game's most expensive goalkeeper, and inside forward Dennis Stevens from Bolton. Stevens, Stevens, the net. Then Catterick signed the ill-fated wing half Tony Kay from Sheffield Wednesday, outside right Alex Scott from Rangers, and Johnny Morrissey from Liverpool to play on the other flank. Crowds flocked to see Everton set the pace in the 1963 championship race. With Liverpool back in the first division under Bill Shankly, league derbies resumed. A crowd of 73,000 were at Goodison to see the Merseyside rivals meet in September. Everton had won seven of their opening nine games. Gabriel for Everton now. To Vernon. Vernon can't get his shot away. Just again, comes out to Bingham. Bingham with a flick. And it looked like a handball. It looked like a handball. It's going to be a handball. Yes, a penalty to Everton. Twenty-eight minutes of play gone in the first half. And a handball there means a penalty for Everton. Bernal placing the ball. Who's going to be the man to take it? Boy Bannon coming up for the ball. Everton skipper. 
Welsh International, remember that Everton have twice had this ball in the Liverpool net. And here's Bernard coming up for the penalty. 28 minutes of play gone. Again the long cross, trying to find Callahan, but Thompson is there, best comes to Callahan. Callahan with the chip, it must be a goal! But it was Everton who were in the more powerful form that autumn, losing only one game in a run of 15. Oh, no, it's Everton coming on the attack. Morrissey. Morrissey taking it the other side of Charles. Morrissey with a cross. Comes to Bingham. Bingham must score. And it's there. Hinton. Not controlling it. And McMeegan nicely dribbling his way out of trouble. To Vernon. Vernon, beautiful body swerve. Vernon, a lovely ball indeed through to Young. Young with a shot. It's a goal. Oh, a great goal. Well, Alec Young took the opportunity to put that ball in the net, but what a glorious pass that was from Roy Vernon. As captain, Vernon was a fount of inspiration. Oh, lovely ball through to Vernon. Vernon with a chance. There it is. It must be. After the big freeze in 1963, Everton went back to the top of the first division thanks to Alex Young's winning goal against Tottenham at Goodison in April. They were never deposed. The fans celebrated Everton's sixth title after a 4-1 win over Fulham. Catterick had found the championship formula in his second season and Goodison was once more the school of science. With the close of cricket, the opening of the soccer season. The sense of expectation was nationwide, even though it does herald the end of summer. We went along to Goodison Park, Liverpool, to join the crowds converging for Everton's opener against Fulham. Fulham kick off, and Everton, in dark shirts, quickly take command. In spite of the absence of Vernon, they were to keep it for the whole game. goal from a young centre was put into his own goal by Macedo. The reigning champions on the march again and their supporters following every move. In the second half, Fulham still had a tough time of it. Everton eventually brought off a 3-0 victory. First of all the Saturdays to come, for all the dads and all the mums, thrills and excitement, whatever your age. The unpredictable kaleidoscope of another soccer season, with every encounter offering dismal failure or jubilant success. Success was now widespread on Merseyside. There was plenty of trade passing through the port. Lots of work available in the docks. Bags of pride in what Scousers saw as the capital of the north. The early 60s also brought the Mersey sound, as a string of Liverpool-based groups like the Beatles dominated the charts. 
showbiz stars had a Liverpool accent, and so did many comedians. I say there's two, two teams in this city, Everton and Everton Reserves. Well, I went to see Liverpool first, and the particular game I went to see, they got beat 13-0. <laughs> <laughs> and the next week I went to see Everton and they won 8-0, so it was only that, so I was going to, I was going to support the best. That's the way it is. Could you ever imagine yourself as a Liverpool supporter? No, you may as well ask me to change my religion. <laughs> the TV series Z Cars was also centred on Merseyside, and Evertonians were quick to adopt its theme tune as their own. But in the European Cup, Everton found themselves handcuffed by Inter Milan, the Italian champions. They came to Goodison for the first leg and escaped with a nil-nil draw. In the second leg in the San Siro Stadium, Everton lost 1-0 and Catterick gave 18-year-old Colin Harvey a surprise first-team debut. So I thought, well, that's it, there's about 15 skips going and I'm going to have to carry the lot. And sure enough, I arrived at the ground carrying the skips and uh, we had a long delay at uh, Manchester Airport, fog or something like that, and uh, arrived all hours of the morning, Tuesday. Tuesday afternoon, a little training session, still collecting the kit in and bringing the balls in and all that sort of thing. And then a meeting on Wednesday afternoon, the afternoon before the, the game, and Harry Catrick just said, uh, oh, Colin will come in uh, and play inside forward. F flabbergasted, I mean, I thought basically I was only there to do the bits and pieces, and uh, sure enough, he just dropped it. He kept it as late as he possibly could, which was the right thing to do, um, so I didn't worry about it. just went to bed, I had an hour of sleep, and then uh, next minute with the San Siro. Harvey was to make a lasting impression, not least in the FA Cup in 1966. Everton played Manchester United in the semi-final at Burnden Park, Bolton. United were without George Best, but still included Dennis Law and Bobby Charlton. Everton, though, had yet to concede a goal in the competition. They'd played six matches, including three against Manchester City in the sixth round, and their defence, now including England left-back Ray Wilson, had been superb. So it was at Burnden Park as they resisted everything that Manchester United's multi-talented champions could throw at them. Everton get it away, and then came the goal that shattered Manchester's hopes. Harvey takes a temporal pass and shoots confidently past Harry Gray. Everton almost made it 2-0, failing by the barest fraction of an inch. Once again, it was Temple who did the groundwork, but watch what happened to the shot from Young. So there it is. Everton have reached the final for the first time in 33 years. And it was another landmark in the Catterick era. Everton's Wembley opponents were his previous club, Sheffield Wednesday. Catterick made one difficult decision before the match. He left out his expensive centre-forward, Fred Pickering, who sat and watched as his replacement, whose name wasn't even on the programme, became Everton's hero. Pressmen often found these doer days in reporting Goodison affairs, so it seems strange that Everton should open their dressing room doors to film cameras before the cup final. It was a unique insight into how star players prepared for a big match, but it was unfancied Sheffield Wednesday who made the better start. Everton are lining up with a, a back four of right, then Lapone, then Harris number six, and then Vincent three. What's a good throw to four? Macalio got out! And Macalio has scored the heavy wins in. Can Alex Young do it? No. And it's Panther taking over. So well. Oh, he's going for a lovely moment. It's going to be the second goal by Ford. A goal. And that should just about clinch it. And on Wednesday's Cup, it's Ford. That's Hardy to Gabriel to Harris. Now a chance for Bill Cole. Everton. 
Sheffield Wednesday have brought everybody back now. They have 11 men between the wall and their goal. Scott with the ticket, there you see. Harris moving up. Scott. The Bilko. A goal is equalised. And two Everton supporters have raced onto the pitch and they've swamped in Trebilco. And their two supporters are going to see no more of this game. One of them thinks it. And a great tackle. Almost on the line. Almost on the line as that Everton supporter slipped his coat. And the phone probably telling the man to go quietly. And who's that? Harris, I think. Where Harris was wearing the policeman's helmet. Trivilco, a player for the modest Plymouth Argyle, not so long ago, now the scorer of two goals at Wembley. Everton buzzing around with much more purpose than they were doing, covering the gaps, making it almost impossible for Wednesday to create space and now a great chance of that mistake by Jerry Young in the and it's the third goal! Oh, what a tragedy for Jerry Young! shade of odds that all the Everton players don't get up underneath that back slapping. There's Laboon and there Her Royal Highness Princess Margaret with the cup. A great cup battle. A fantastic comeback. And the medal for Skipper Brian Laboon and there is the Hamilton on the outskirts of Liverpool and manager Harry Catrick with the Lord Mayor, Alderman David Cowley, prepare for the tumultuous 10-mile drive to St George's Hall. may have broken records, gate receipts higher than ever before, but they were nothing to the crowds of Liverpool. No other city can produce crowd scenes like this, and for the second year running, they turned out to honour a cup-winning team. So, with Liverpool crown champions, both trophies were on display at the Charity Shield at Goodison in August. So too was the World Cup, courtesy of Everton's Ray Wilson and Liverpool's Roger Hunt, two of England's heroes. Some of the best matches had been staged at Goodison. Brazil with Pelé, Portugal with Eusebio, Hungary with Florian Albert, all a delighted and appreciative Merseyside public. But it was an Englishman who caught Catterick's eye. The youngest member of Ramsey's team, 21-year-old Alan Ball, joined Everton from Blackpool for a record £110,000. His competitive streak and boundless energy heralded an exciting time. In only his second match at Goodison, Ball scored twice in a 3-1 win over Liverpool. And later that season, he knocked the enemy out of the FA Cup, watched by 105,000 Merseysiders. 64,000 jammed Goodison, while a further 41,000 watched on closed-circuit screens at Anfield as Ball swooped to score the only goal. That same week, Everton also beat Liverpool to the signature of Preston's young wing half, Howard Kendall. What an influential part he would play in the Blues' future. In his first full season, linking up in midfield with Ball and Harvey, Kendall too got the winning goal in a Merseyside derby, as Catterick's new Everton team began to take shape. Belfield had now been developed into a superb private training complex. Here, coach Wilf Dixon got the players fit, while Catterick waited to talk tactics. How is your coming up? 
Hey, you can't. Up, get right. Up. Left. Up. You're not concentrating on the ball. And when you pull it through your legs, I want you to go three or four yards quickly. So if you're really making a move, you drag it and go it. Take the ball first and then play it back. Yes. Not first time this time. Get it. That's it. Then play it back. I think it'd be sense you on Saturday to to thicken the centre of this field by playing three men in here, <coughs> pulling Sandy Brown back. They have players like McClintock and Samuels who do a prolific amount of work in midfield. And with that in mind, we'll have one player brought back out of the front four, playing in front of our two normal midfield players, Colin Harvey and um, Howard. I think this way we will gain more possession in midfield. But the 60s belong to Alex Young, his reputation confirmed by a BBC drama documentary. What's your name? Jane. How old are you? Five. What does your daddy do? Play football. Who for? Everton. Is he good? Yes. What's his name? Alex Young. <laughs> sometimes when I'm on I, I can play as well as anybody when I when, when I know I'm playing well and if I feel well and I'm playing well I'm I think I can uh, I can compare with anybody when I'm playing well and sometimes I, uh, I sort of drop down the depths a bit I can't understand it myself I've tried to think about it but uh, it just happens and sometimes I'm not as good other times I'm Quite good deal. Young was fading out by the time Johnny Morris's penalty beat Leeds in the Cup semi final of 1968. Everton's opponents in their seventh FA Cup final were West Bromwich Albion, whose centre forward, Jeff Astle, had scored in every round. That disappointment only hardened Everton's ambition. They'd finished sixth fifth and third in consecutive seasons and started their 1969-70 program at Highbury where there were signs they were ready to pitch again for the championship. The winning goal here came from number 10 John Hurst and Catterick's team won 15 of their first 18 matches. They had so many attacking options with a young centre forward who wasn't frightened by the comparison with number nines of the past. Royal Royal. Husband, almost nonchalant, isn't it? Morrissey. Oh, a great goal! A lovely goal by Morrissey! A ball for Everton. Husband unmarked on the right.
Harvey. Oh, it's a goal! Thanks partly to Whittle's goals, he scored 11 in 13 games, Everton took the title from Leeds. The team consisted of Gordon West in goal, Catterick's first signing. Tommy Wright at right back, where he played for England in Mexico. Left back Sandy Brown, later replaced by new signing Keith Newton. Howard Kendall in the number four shirt, later to manage two championship sides. Captain Brian LeBone, the last of the Corinthians, Catterick called him. Colin Harvey, classy and constructive, the complete wing half. Jimmy Husband, an outside right with a flair for the unpredictable. Alan Ball, perpetual motion, at his peak, world class. Joe Royal, a centre forward in the true Everton mould. John Hurst, a solid, dependable central defender and Johnny Morrissey, a live-wire left winger with a powerful shot. When Everton clinched the title at Goodison, nine points ahead of Leeds and setting a club record of 66 points, Catterick knew it had been achieved in Everton's treasured, cultured tradition. This is what the British public want. Let's have this skillful football. How do you reckon this team compares with your 1963 championship team? Well, the two different types of sides. Uh, virtually the 1963 team was a side I got together uh, through the medium of uh, the transfer market uh, and as it were I inherited here. The present side has been built by me through uh, youngsters developing uh, from school into top class players and uh, buyers such as Kendall and, uh, and Ball, great players. We had Candle Ball and Harvey and that was it. I mean, <laughs> we just used to go out and give it to them and that, that was, it was all over. <laughs> Virtually, that's exaggerating a bit because we had a, a very good side besides that, but that was a super side for pure football. I think the 62 side, 63 side were a good combination of a side, but this one was a pure footballing side. The short corner by Everton. That's Morrissey. Ball. Husband with the corner. Morrissey, and off the line, it's a goal! Goal by Kendall. Ball. Royal, now he's got it! Oh, that was a great goal. That was a great goal by Joe Royal. Right. Ball. Again, Colchester have got 11 men back in their own penalty box. Ball with the free kick. And it's there. Howard Kendall. Husband. To ball. Oh, Kendall. Two. Beautiful football by Everton. Graham to Carrillo. Oh, he's talked himself into trouble. It's Royal. It's three. Corella, a terrible mistake. Gibbs leaving it for Lewis. Now you've got to move quickly when you beat one man against a team like Everton. Royal to Harvey. To Osmond. Is this going to be four? Yes! Royal to Osmond. Has been very difficult, difficult to shake off the ball and what a save! Ball has scored number five. Andy Rankin's memorable penalty save furthered Everton's double cup bid in 1971, putting the German champions, Borussia Mönchengladbach, out of the European Cup at Goodison. But 
But in the quarter-final against Panathinaikos, Everton were in for a shock. The Greeks opened the scoring in the first leg on Merseyside, an away goal that was to prove decisive. Although Everton equalised with the last kick of the game through their 19-year-old substitute David Johnson on his first European appearance, that goal was not enough. Everton could only draw nil-nil in Athens and went out on the away goals rule. This was a watershed week in Everton's history. Three days later, they took the lead against Liverpool in the FA Cup semi-final at Old Trafford through Alan Ball, but lost the game 2-1. And later that year, Ball left for Arsenal. Catterick's team was breaking up, and so was his health. After a heart attack, he was moved sideways after 12 years as boss and died at a cup tie at Goodison in 1985. Harry is remembered with respect by all those who worked for him. Dead straight, no messing. You know, one and one was two, 11 o'clock was 11 o'clock. Might be seen a bit childish, you had to clock in at Belfield. We, we got a bit upset about that, but uh, he used to say if you're late on a Monday morning, you've had since 20 to five on a Saturday to get here, so what's your excuse? And you couldn't really <laughs> complain about that. Not a great tracksuit manager, in fact he wasn't, I mean he very, very seldom came out during the week, but when he appeared he, we were all in awe of him and uh, this, this worked to his advantage, I mean he picked out little things and what he said was law and you tried your very best to do it and um, his record um, as an Everton manager was absolutely outstanding. Billy Bingham took over from Catterick ten years after playing in Everton's 1963 championship side. In his first season he broke the transfer record to sign a centre forward. King. Lions and odds, and touched in beautifully by Latchford. Bob Latchford, valued at £350,000, was top league scorer for Everton in his first four seasons, including one haul of 30. But it was the man whose header made the opening for him here, who was to be a stalwart figure at Goodison during what proved an inconsistent period for the club in the mid to late 70s. Mike Lyons, a true Evertonian if ever there was one, served the cause valiantly in defence and in attack. Latchford, oh yes! Lyons! Nick Lyons the scorer. Lyons was brave and unselfish, but in 11 seasons as a first team player, including several as captain, he never won a major honour with Everton. He also scored one own goal that he can't forget. Oh, well, it was at Anfield, I mean, obviously the place to score one. And it was in the Anfield Road end, and uh, Mark Higgins passed the ball back to me. It was nil-nil at the time. And uh, I, like, half-volleyed it back to Georgie Wood, about 40 yards out, and I went right in the top corner. So anyway, oh, I was right, destroyed, scored a goal for, you know, I never scored a goal in the derby. That was my only one, you see. So the, the cop was chatting me, chatting me name and that. And at the end of the game, I was still, uh, you know, uh, utterly demoralised and that. And it was uh, we were at the, we all were all the lads went for a drink afterwards, and this Evertonian kept coming up to me and saying, "Oh, Lions, I think you're great. Oh, good lad, you and all that." And Kingy said, "Can't you leave him alone? Can't you see he's sick?" He said, "Oh, yeah, but I made up with him." He said, "Why is that?" He said, "Oh, I want 40 quid in him to get the first goal today. <laughs> so at least I made one Evertonian's day, if not the rest." <laughs> Duncan McKenzie made many Evertonians happy with his twinkling toes when he and Bruce Rioch came to Goodison, but a month after signing them, Billy Bingham was sacked and Gordon Lee arrived from Newcastle. Almost at once, Lee and Everton were embroiled in a League Cup final against Aston Villa. The teams drew nil-nil at Wembley after extra time and went to Hillsborough for a replay. Villa scored first, an unfortunate own goal by Roger Kenyon, who had several seasons as Lebone's successor at centre-half. Villa were within a minute of winning that night, but it said much for the spirit in the Everton camp at that time as they tried to stay out of the shadow of Liverpool, that they should equalise and force extra time. Bob Latchford, who'd scored the winning goal at Bolton in the semi-final, was on hand to force the final into a third match. Somebody said this Goodison era was about the four L's, Lee, Latchford, Lyons and Luck. The first three did their job when the teams met again at Old Trafford, but Luck wasn't on the side of another L, goalkeeper David Lawson. Mind you, the night started well enough for Evertonians. McNaught came in and Latchford! For a side who've been behind, Villa's play is still orderly and composed. Here's Nickel. Oh yes!
And now, could Villa come again and win it? Here's Little. And he's got there. Lyons getting in. Dobson's there. And Lyons is there. And Lyons. Mike Lyons. It's 2-2. This is Smith. Oh, and Little is going to score. Oh, what a terrible defensive disaster for Everton. Ten days later, Everton met Liverpool in the FA Cup semi-final at Main Road. Twice behind, they again showed their powers of recovery. Duncan McKenzie had a hand in both goals. And it's going to come to Dobson. McKenzie! <laughs> On by McKenzie for Pearson. And here's McKenzie again. To all. Then, three minutes from time, came the moment that still rankles with Evertonians. Ronnie Goodless crossed, Mackenzie flicked it on, and Brian Hamilton turned the ball past Clements for what everybody, including Liverpool, instantly thought was the winning goal. Referee Clive Thomas disallowed it, apparently feeling that Hamilton had used his hand or arm. Later, there was some suggestion of offside, but neither explanation appeased Everton. Liverpool won the replay and continued to dominate affairs on Merseyside. But Everton's fans had one sublime moment of revenge at Goodison in 1978. Dobson is in there, it's going to fall for Andy King! Oh yes, he's got it! Andy King has scored! This was part of Everton's best ever start to a season, unbeaten in their first 19 league matches. Winners over Liverpool for the first time in seven years. Lee's team had finished third and fourth in the league and in 1980 he took Everton to another FA Cup semi-final. Their opponents, as in 1933, were second division West Ham. And after a draw at Villa Park, they met again at Leeds. Devonshire. Pearson, Devonshire, he's in the gap. Can he put it in? He can! Oh, that's a brilliant goal! That is a marvellous goal! Berardi, Lampard has got it away, but up comes right. Seven minutes left. Plenty of Everton players forward. Oh, that's done it superbly by Lansford. Pike, Brooking, Cross. Gordon Lee had gone close, but now Everton's form slumped. In May 1981, they finished 15th, and he was dismissed. Philip Carter, now the club chairman, described Lee's successor, Howard Kendall, as an Everton man at heart, one of the finest players ever to come out of the club. We felt very strongly, and I felt in particular, that he was a man that had the potential to be um, a superb manager for Everton, and that really was why we took him on, even at that stage, whilst he was still a comparatively young man and only had limited experience at the level of Blackburn Rovers football club. But Kendall wasn't successful immediately. Some of the new faces he brought in didn't fit, although Neville Southall was an early signing. The second intake eventually was better. Peter Reid came from Bolton. Kevin Sheedy from Liverpool. Trevor Stephen from Burnley. And Adrian Heath from Stoke. 
all would win major honours with the club, but not before a crisis loomed. In December 1983, Everton was struggling in the bottom half of the table and the soccer grapevine said Kendall was just a few days away from the sack. The lowest point in his Everton fortunes came on New Year's Eve, when a crowd of only 13,500 at Goodison saw a tedious goalless draw against Coventry City. At the final whistle, they made their feelings clear. struggling in this manner and receiving this kind of treatment from their own supporters. A draw at Stoke on January the 14th meant Everton slipped to 18th. The manager was aware of the gossip and the fans' disenchantment. Well, there was a struggle on our hands. Um, they weren't seeing the performances that they wanted to see. They weren't getting the results that they wanted. And naturally, um, I was in a position where I desperately wanted to give them the success. The last thing Kendall needed, four days later, was a League Cup quarter-final on the ground of third division giant killers, Oxford United. Kevin Brock's back pass has, rightly or wrongly, been singled out as the turning point for Kendall and Everton. From the moment Adrian Heath scored nine minutes from time, his team were back on the rails. Indeed, Everton was suddenly approaching Wembley on two routes. One of the reasons for the rejuvenation was the form and influence of Andy Gray, signed from Wolves when things were at a low ebb in November. And Andy Gray has scored! from a virtually horizontal position. Gray wasn't eligible for the League Cup final in which Everton drew with Liverpool and lost the replay. But Kendall's team booked a second Wembley appearance when Heath headed the winner against Southampton at Highbury. Everton's opponents in their first FA Cup final for 16 years would be Watford. And here he is again. And the cross headed half away. And Stephen Sharp. And a goal for Everton by Graham Sharp. Even again. Gray and Sharp waiting in the centre. And Gray is closing in here. Oh, and Sherwood didn't collect. And the goal is given. The challenge of Gray, too much for the goalkeeper. And Everton are 2-0 in the lead. And Sherwood disappointed. Gray and Everton ecstatic. As Trevor Stephen crossed the ball from the right. Andy Gray comes in, not by Steve Terry. Steve, what a fine match he's having and Andy Gray just comes in and the two of them take a tumble up the stairs they go and Kevin Ratcliffe the youngest FA Cup winning captain for 20 years since Bobby Moore received the cup for West Ham back in 64 he's only 23 he goes forward to receive the FA Cup on behalf of Everton Football Club the important thing really was not to, to have a one-season wonder, um, as we, we did in 1970. And it was, it was important after winning the FA Cup uh, that we, we strive to, to become the, the best team in the league. And we did that the following year. Kendall was right on the mark. Liverpool has always been a city of great civic pride. It was now a city of two cathedrals, 
and in 1984, a city wants more with two highly successful football clubs. That season too, Everton's neighbours on the other side of Stanley Park, at Anfield, had won a treble. The League Championship, the League Cup and the European Cup for the fourth time. Now, at the start of the following season, Everton themselves had their eyes on triple honours. Indeed, Liverpool were one of their early victims, on a ground where Everton hadn't won for 14 and a half years, since their last championship season. Reed, Stevens, looking for Sharp, and he got behind Lawrence and there did Sharp! What a fantastic goal! An unbelievable finish from Graham Sharp! And the Evertonians have gone berserk! I haven't seen a goal quite like that in a Merseyside derby for years. Absolutely marvellous to see him get behind the defender and then take it first time on the volley, giving Grobelon no chance. A week later, Evertonian celebrated the slaying of another giant. Kevin Sheedy's header put Kendall's team on the way to a thumping win against Manchester United at Goodison. Sheedy had just come back after injury, and this was to be one of his best seasons. He also got the second against Ron Atkinson's team, and Everton went on to produce a vintage display which brought back fond memories of 1970. Before half-time, with United in complete disarray, Heath turned in Everton's third. In the second half, right back Gary Stevens, on the verge of an England call-up, struck number four. With Kevin Ratcliffe and Derek Mountfield forming a solid barrier at the back, Peter Reid and Paul Bracewell forging a fruitful link in midfield, Everton were rampant. Graham Sharp got the fifth goal, and he was at the sharp end of many attacks as Everton took over at the top and went on to win the championship with 90 points. While his colleagues were scoring goals, Neville Southall was stopping them. Must be Verratti! Oh, what a brilliant save! Real congestion on the near post, on by lines. Brilliant save again! And then one off the crossbar. First from Smith, the second from Marwood. Unbelievable stuff! Everton clinched the title against Queen's Park Rangers. Derek Mountfield scored one of his 14 goals and Sharp one of his 30. Kendall, who'd played in Everton's last championship team 15 years earlier, congratulated the modern stars who'd brought the club their eighth title. Bracewell had proved an inspired signing. Southall, a world-class goalkeeper. With one trophy collected, Ratcliffe's team went in search of two more. In the European Cup Winners' Cup, Everton beat Fortuna Sittard to reach the semi-final. There, they drew 0-0 with Bayern Munich in the first leg, but the Germans scored first in the return at Goodison through Dieter Hernis. Now Everton showed their real mettle and gave their supporters a night they'll always remember. I think that was maybe one of the best games I've ever played in. Um, atmosphere, I mean, you're talking about there was 49 to 50,000 here and out of that there was 200 Bayern Munich fans. The rest of them were Everton fans and they're all screaming for Everton. And they've scored early on. It's 1-0 at half-time, I think it was. And you can always remember the words that Howard said on the night that if we keep playing the way that we are, that the Gladys Street will suck, suck the goals in for us. And uh, it couldn't have been a truer statement, really, because I think uh, 
you know, we just overwhelmed them in the second half. We just really pounded them. I think maybe that goes down to one of the best games that I've ever played in. It was also one of the many occasions during that season that Andy Gray proved himself a genuine hero. He had a hand in all three goals as Everton stormed into their first ever European final. Trevor Stevens' goal sparked off the celebrations. Was this the man who was supposedly facing the sack just 15 months earlier? Now Kendall and his crew were bound for Rotterdam. Their opponents in the final were the Austrians' rapid Vienna. By now, Gray could do no wrong. His was the first goal here, 12 minutes into the second half. A quarter of an hour later, from Sheedy's corner, Trevor Stephen made it 2-0. Rapide got one back through their accomplished striker, Hans Krankel. But the Austrians hardly had time to draw breath before Sheedy's unerring left foot restored Everton's two-goal advantage. With their fans behaving impeccably, the only sad aspect of Everton's 3-1 victory was that the horror of Heysel meant they would be denied the chance to play in the European Champions Cup. But could they complete a treble? Luton were their opponents in the FA Cup semi-final at Villa Park. Off it's there. And here's Hill. Ricky Hill! Beautifully taken. He drove one. It's there! Sheedy! Sheedy curls it. Mount Hill's there! But at Wembley, the ten men of Manchester United got the better of battle-weary Everton in extra time. And here's Whiteside. Strachan is following up. Olsen on this side. That's all he's got. Whiteside shoots. It's there! Norman Whiteside has done it again. No Everton team in 107 years had put together a season like this. Never had the club's motto, nothing but the best is good enough, been observed so thoroughly. Oh, there's some tremendous characters in it as well. I mean, Andy Gray up front, Peter Reid, Kevin Ratcliffe. I mean, there were um, Neville Southall who went through a tremendous spell as well. I mean, you're going right down the middle of the field there and they were all tremendous players. And the younger ones started to come through as well. Gary Stevens was improving. Trevor Stephen came into his own on the right. And uh, generally things were starting to gel together and they were beginning to believe that they were an outstanding side. But the manager of the year still wasn't satisfied. Liverpool had won nothing in 1985. That in itself was ominous. Kendall may have felt, looking back, that his appointment of Harvey as first-team coach in those dark days of 1983 had been highly significant, as had the purchase of Andy Gray, who now moved on to Aston Villa. Into the Goodison dressing room now walked Gary Lineker for £800,000 plus a share of any future transfer fee. He was in good company, Everton's ranks were packed with internationals. The ground was an autograph hunter's paradise. The squad system Liverpool had made work so handsomely now applied here. Everton had never allowed money to stop them improving their team. But nobody surely expected 40 goals in a season from Lineker. For Lineker to chase and just look at his pace. And again Trevor Stephen. And Lineker, and he's buried it! And again it ran a little kindly, and here's Lineker! And that's his second... Stephen. Lineker! Bracewell. And still... Uh, Lineker! But he didn't hit it quite truly. But he doesn't care and neither do the crowd. Lineker's goals kept Everton out in front until the end of March. Only a superhuman effort by Liverpool pushed them into second place. His turbocharged strike rate made Lineker the professional's choice as their player of the year. And the football writers followed suit with their prestigious Footballer of the Year award, which Southall had won a year earlier. Yet another honour for Everton. Two days later, Lineker was part of a slice of football history. The first ever all-Merseyside FA Cup final. Liverpool going for the League and Cup double, Everton of all people, the only club who could stop them. 
Many critics believe the outcome would hinge on the two match winners, Lineker and his Liverpool counterpart, Ian Rush. It was the Everton man who struck first. Now Reid. Lineker off through the centre again. This is promising. Lineker for Everton. Saved by Bobola. Lineker. 1-0 to Everton. And who else but Gary Lineker? His 40th goal of the season for Everton. The footballer of the year. Kendall felt this should have been Everton's second goal. They had a penalty appeal turned down before Lineker scored. But it was only 1-0 at half-time, and after the break, the game changed. Now Rush took over, and Liverpool came back to win 3-1. The double was theirs. Everton returned to Merseyside, runners-up to their rivals in both league and cup. With Lineker moving to Barcelona for two and a quarter million pounds, Howard Kendall had to find a way of retrieving top spot. He and his team were not found wanting. Good cross, sharp, hit the bar, and in! Sharp, Watson's in there, Sheedy, goal! There's Heath, oh, that's a superb goal! Sheedy! Four Everton players already in the area. Oh, it's beautifully done. And Heath comes in and a goal for Everton. The championship was confirmed at Norwich with a goal from Pat van den Howe. It was Everton's ninth title, and with the Football League centenary looming, it was worth underlining that Everton, one of the founder members in 1888, had only been out of the first division for just four seasons. No other club could come near that record, nor Everton's all-time total of first division points. Howard Kendall left on a high note. With two championships in three years, besides the FA Cup and a European trophy, he was ready for a fresh challenge and accepted an offer to coach Athletic Bilbao in Spain. The end of an era at Goodison. Howard, of course, had been so successful over here with, with a major club such as Everton that he was understandably, I think, approached by uh, foreign clubs and namely Barcelona. There was that slight controversy at the time where Teddy Venables was going and then he wasn't going and then decided eventually to stay. And I think that unsettled Howard because he'd had this approach. He'd obviously looked at the situation and decided that the continent had something to offer to him. And therefore, when he came at the end and said, well, really, he thought that he would take a position up on the comp continent, I mean, it wasn't too much of a surprise, but it was a great, great disappointment. Kendall's successor was his right-hand man, Colin Harvey. Everton had adopted the Anfield watchword, continuity. It was one of the least difficult decisions I've ever had to make. Colin Harvey was absolute natural as far as I was concerned. Obviously, I was overjoyed and uh, at the same time you're filled with a certain amount of trepidation because uh, here you are following the, the all-time great manager. In Harvey's first season, the title went back across Stanley Park, but Everton did have the satisfaction of beating their neighbours twice in the Littlewoods Cup at Anfield and then ending Liverpool's extraordinary run of 29 league games without defeat from the start of the season. Wayne Clark's goal, captured by ITV cameras, prevented a new record. Harvey kept his coaching staff within the family, appointing Evertonians like himself. In the summer of 1988, he launched a major rebuilding programme with an outlay of four and a half million pounds. Tony Cotty was signed from West Ham for an Everton record of two million. A natural goal scorer to complement the unselfish Sharp, he started with a hat-trick on his Everton debut. Scottish international winger Pat Nevin brought his box of tricks from Chelsea. The tribunal set his fee at £925,000. Stuart McCall from Bradford City cost £875,000. And Neil MacDonald arrived from Newcastle for over half a million, a replacement for Gary Stevens. Such a heavy investment said an awful lot about the pride, prestige and history of Everton Football Club. They've always believed in style, quality and the pursuit of excellence. The School of Science always uh, nil satis, nil the optimum. I don't speak Latin, but that's nothing satisfies but the best. That, that sticks with me, yeah. You walk in the dressing room and you see the famous players around you. You know, I was only 20 years of age and there was household names around you in the dressing room and I think that that was, that was the thing that really hit me. I, Harry Catrick, when he, when he signed me, 
in the car park at Preston, turned around and said, well, welcome to the big time. Everton's the team. Mm. Yeah, I was at Arsenal, but Arsenal was just another side as I was concerned. Basically, you're talking about Everton being my life, really. Everton has a style and an image, but it's a question of quality, reliability, dependability, all those things which we look for in life generally. I think they're embodied in this club. I mean, I think this club has tremendous tradition. I've been to a few clubs, great clubs, Aston Villa, Huddersfield, Liverpool, but Everton, there's something magic, you know, about it. And uh, I'm just an Evertonian, that's all. Don't forget, lads, one Evertonian is worth 20 Liverpudlians. And that's, that's, that's the way I feel. I'm so biased about this club here. It's the best. The biggest and the best. Yeah.